So can we just love on Dan as he comes? Dan Muller, everyone. Thank you, sir. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Wow. I got saved in 95. So that's when that was all breaking out. That was one of my bedroom songs. So when you hear one of those songs in a service and you've developed a relational knowing of him through that song, it hits you pretty good. <laughs> so I was sitting there the same way. I was like, oh, no, Lord. <laughs> and uh, I've knelt in my bedroom with the door closed a thousand times and sang that song. And uh, it's a real heart cry. It's a prayer song. And in between, you pray and you talk to him and you sing some more lyrics and you go back into prayer and communion. And it's really important to have those times with the Lord where you're not just praying your list of the things you want him to do or hope he does. It's really important to commune with him and, and fellowship with him and be with him. Amen. Amen. Thank you just for this morning. This was a full morning already. I was like, go have a great day. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the worship leader, wherever you are, man, he got into that word time, that spoken word time. How powerful was that? And just like these one line exhortations just kept going, bam, bam. I was like, what? I was just ready to go be free. Amen. <laughs> and then uh, you, young man, thank you. I said to David, I said, who's that? That was so full of truth. That was God. That was the word. So I said, to, I said to David, I said, you know, every time I come down here, I see so many people filled with so much word. It's a good testimony of this house. And then you, dear woman of God, got up there. I, I, I'll be honest. I get, I get nervous. I'd, I'd rather never even do offerings. Like, I get nervous at offering time. But the scriptural context and motive that you presented in offering was amazingly clean and pure and beautiful. And I was sitting there going, what a tone for offering. It, it probably helped me as much as it blessed me. Because I struggle in that arena because there's been so much misappropriation with tithing and giving and money and offerings. And pastors don't even know this, but I've stopped offerings over the years while they were taking them. And and, and because I was so troubled, but I made an excuse for it in the sense where I protected them. Nobody knew I was stopping it because of what they were saying. <laughs> but I couldn't take it. So I'd just say, excuse me, pastor, right in the middle of the offering. And then I'd cry and say, listen, I don't actually feel like I'm supposed to receive anything this weekend. And I wish we'd had this conversation. It caught me off guard and I wasn't prepared to. And I, but I'm stopping and I don't mean And I'd turn and say to the people and explain my heart and the whole time protecting him. But stopped it because the motive wasn't right. And just thank you for the purity in that motive today and the scriptures that you used and your closing prayer. It just couldn't have been more beautiful and more clean. Yeah. And I was like, wow. So thank you. That really helped me. No, it did. The biggest, the weakest area of my life is receiving finances. The Lord, one time somebody was giving me something years ago, and I've still haven't, I've still maybe the best I've done is a C plus if you grade me. <laughs> this young lady came up and she just put money in my hand and I'm uncomfortable with that. And I kind of balked a little and said, oh, honey, and the Lord said, can't you ever just say thank you? <laughs> and in my heart, I started to cry. And in my heart, I was like, no, I don't think I can. I don't know how. I really don't know how. Because it's the last thing on my mind. It's the last reason why I do what I do. And I pastored for a long enough time to see that it's actually a major reason in a lot of people doing. And it's touched me in ways where it's like it's so not important to me. So when somebody does it, I have a hard time just saying thank you. And the Lord said, can't you ever just say thank you? Which means there's a pure side to giving. Which means that young lady was doing that so from her heart before the Lord that it would have been beautiful to just say, oh my goodness, girl, that's so humbling. Thank you. And I didn't know how to do that. And I still have never gotten past probably a C plus. 
I don't know if anybody's ever given me anything where I haven't winced, made a face, or acted like I didn't want it. <laughs> ever. I don't know that I've ever actually just looked anybody in the eyes and said, wow, that's incredible. Thanks for your heart. And I need to learn to. I'm, I'm confessing weakness to you right now. This is a, like it's if there's something in my life that needs to grow, it's that one. The presentation of your offering today was as pure as pure could be. It helped me. Thank you. Yeah. I don't know if, if, if anybody noticed, but like there's nowhere, you can't find anywhere to give to me on the internet, anywhere. There's nowhere to partner with me. I've never received an offering. I've never asked for a penny in my whole Christian life. There's nowhere on the internet. My website is so pitiful, it's not even a website. <laughs> like my website is pitiful. Yeah, thank you for agreeing with me. <laughs> These guys are ear to ear smiles. Amen, brother. <laughs> But yet people bless me and give to me. They go out of their way to find out if there's a way to bless me. And I'm like, that's ridiculous. <laughs> like there's people out there saying, please give to me. <laughs> and they're, they're not getting enough a lot of times saying, please give to me. <laughs> Telling all the reasons you need to get behind them and support them and help them and bless them. And I'm not saying it's illegitimate. Sometimes it's legitimate. But people are trying to get empowered. And I've never even thought about it. There's nowhere out there telling you how to do that. <laughs> and people go out there. I was just down in Florida and this lady said, my friend is so excited. She just found that she can actually empower you and bless you and give to you. She found out how she can do that. And she's so excited. She said she was on a mission for two straight hours making phone calls and trying to figure out if there's a way to bless you. And I'm like, she took two hours to try to <laughs> And people say, well, why don't you make it easy for people and just let them? And I'm like, because I'm not asking for anything. I'm just not. When it comes to finances, but people find a way to give and it's so beautiful and it empowers me. And that's why I don't ask for offerings and receive because if I'm empowered, I'm empowered. Why do you need to reimburse me if I'm empowered? Because sometimes it's a reimbursement. I'm just telling you, it's, it's been, eh. In the church. I said enough on all that, but thank you this morning. <laughs> Help me. Thank you. It was powerful what came out of you. It shows me that your heart sees. You can't talk like that if you don't see something. Yeah? Like it came out of you like water. It came out of you like a tune. It was the same with the worship leader, wherever he is. Thank you. I love to hear the word come out of people like that because the word is what transforms our lives. And, and faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. Sometimes we need to hear something like this young man said over and over and over. And actually, you just start to believe it. Because we've been almost geared to not believe the news that's so good. What I preached last night, you know, somebody says, purify yourself even as he is pure. We are trained to say, well, nobody can really be that pure. I mean, that's Jesus and nobody can have his heart and his. But the truth is we can be squeaky clean, sincere. Amen. He wouldn't give a promise to the pure if you couldn't be pure. But it's been so minimized by our language through our own experiences by even leaders that haven't walked in what he's saying. So then they can't preach what he's saying. That preach their experience. They say well. But the reality is guys. We're always. We're just us. He's him. We're us. And it's like you can come so far. So we kind of leaves the listener. So how far can I go? Let me show you something. Just because we were on this topic. It's even righteousness. Did you ever notice when you talk on Righteousness. It's one of the biggest feuds among the church yeah. by pastors and leaders. I've been around a lot of pastors and leaders. I've been in rooms full of pastors and leaders that like the whole room's pastors and leaders. And it's incredible how there's this big tension over a word like righteousness. We have to be careful how much you preach it because you empower people to sin. You don't want to give people a license to sin. If you're preaching righteousness clearly, you're not teaching people how to sin and get away with it. Yeah. You're teaching them how to be free. From it, it's stain, it's memory, it's sting, it's desire. 
Like righteousness produces holiness. And then we're hesitant to preach it because somebody might misinterpret what we're saying. Well, they misinterpreted Jesus every day of his life and ministry. How can truth stand in front of you and talk and you kill him for his words? I'd say that's misinterpretation. <laughs> like Jesus wasn't preaching the truth. I mean, he was, but it wasn't just preaching the truth. He was the truth. Like, there's no greater authority. He's not going to bring it any clearer. There's no greater revelation than Jesus talking in the streets. It's coming out of his knowing, not his study, not his intellect, not his degree. Anybody can speak the Bible. This man is speaking. He's in the earth. He's in a man's body, and he's the son of God, and he's speaking the revelation of the truth. And then kill him for his words. That's spooky. That we can get so puffed up in pride. We can be so right in our own right. And the way that seemeth right to man can be so dominant. That you can actually not hear truth to the point that you call it a lie. So you better be careful how you hear. I'm like, Lord, I'm puzzled by that. I was sitting on my bed years ago, and I'm like, how could they kill you for what you said? He said they never were listening for what I said. They were listening for what they didn't agree with. So they could never hear what I was saying. See, your motive in hearing determines what you hear. Your motive in seeking. You can, this book is so holy and amazing and powerful and life-giving. But it's also dangerous if you don't read it with a pure heart, if you don't read it with the right motive. You can read your Bible to prove somebody wrong, and you think you found it. You can read your Bible to get out of a marriage, and you think you found it. You can grow up hearing a certain thing in VBS and church background, and then hear something else. And you can read your Bible just to uphold what you've always been taught instead of what are you really saying, God. And actually believe because all you see is through the screen of your motive and actually interpret through your screen instead of through his voice. Are you with me? That's why I said to the pure all things are. So I'm, not, I'm not being rude. I'm not pointing out anybody specific. But why do we have so many streams and rivers and, and things out there that we all say are him? Because our hearts haven't been pure. It says the pure in heart will see God. So going to church and doing church can't be the answer. It has to be becoming more like him. It has to be following him. It has to be walking in the light as he's in the light. A church service isn't going to transform the world, but a life transformed will. Amen. Like tomorrow is traditionally a day that everybody goes to church traditionally. Now there's a circle out there that argues and says... It should be today. <laughs> and they'll fight over stuff like this. But tomorrow, they'll fill churches everywhere. You can fill every seat tomorrow in every church. Just a, it's just a wild thought. Every church that gathers, every seat full, and the world won't take notice. It won't change the world that everybody filled every seat in every church. Because going to church will never change the world. But if half of those people that filled those seats start becoming love, walking in mercy, making peace, not taking account of a suffered wrong, not having a reason for not looking like him, throw away the language that gives me an excuse for however it is I am when it ain't him, that would change things. All of a sudden you ain't growing weary and well-doing. You refuse to be discouraged because it ain't about you. You're living first for the kingdom of God. You're seeking first the kingdom. You're living for glory to his name. You want to manifest him. You actually wake up in the morning and believe this is your purpose. You gave me a purpose. You gave me a destiny. Come on, we sang it today. This was a full morning, man. I heard the word this morning. I got born again this morning. I was like, <laughs> they told me in the car they were believing for me. To get saved, I forget why they said that. It happened this morning. Thank you.
Go to 1 Peter chapter 1. We're going to do one thing based on last night, and then we'll just talk a little bit. But as you're turning there, 1 Peter chapter 1, I want to make this comment on righteousness. See, did you ever notice one of the biggest feuds is over the word righteousness? He tells you, Carlton, he said, if you hunger and thirst for righteousness, you shall be what? Filled. Filled. About two verses later, he says, if you live righteous, you're going to be persecuted. So he's telling you to hunger for something that's going to cause you persecution. Yes, 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 yes. What's he saying? He's saying, I already see ahead of time, men are going to misunderstand the word righteousness, misinterpret it, mispresent it, misread it. But I want you to hunger for it because it's the scepter that I rule my kingdom by. And it's what makes you right in my sight and stand before me, innocent, pure, and holy in my sight. I want you to understand the righteousness that comes through the blood of Jesus Christ. Not self-righteous. The righteousness that comes through the washing of the blood of Jesus Christ that makes you clean as if you've never sinned. And you start preaching that. And religion rises up. People that say they're Christians rise up and say, well, what are you trying to say? And their whole testimony is sin. Well, what are you saying? Are you perfect? Well, we're always sinning. What are you saying? You probably already sinned today. What do you mean you're righteous? What do you mean you're free from sin? I didn't say I'm free from sin. The Bible said it. I didn't get this from me. So he says, seek it. Hunger for it, and you'll be filled. Why? You'll be satisfied in the resume of God. You'll be satisfied in the judgment and testimony of His mercy. You'll be filled. Duh. And when you seek it and get filled by it, you'll get persecuted for it. And it ain't from the world, because they could care less if you say you're righteous. They're like, what is that? Is that goody-goody? You righteous? Is that goody goody? They, the world ain't persecuting you for righteousness. It's in house persecution. Be hated for righteousness. Ain't that something? Because we identify with sin. Instead of identify with him. And we don't understand. We still get tricked into works. And we think because we can sin or we might sin. Some people say, no, you going to sin. How can I reckon myself dead indeed to sin and alive unto God and still carry that conversation? See, that conversation is the deception. That's the distraction. I actually believe it comes from the enemy himself. And, get, and, and well-meaning people get tricked. They actually believe what they're saying. They're convicted by what they're saying. They're not the devil in disguise. I'm not saying the people in church are, 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 are wolf in sheep's clothing. It's a misunderstanding of truth. It's a misunderstanding of scripture. So because, <laughs> bless you, buddy. He just practicing what he's called to. He's just going to be in there. He's like, I might as well get used to this. I might as well get familiar. I got to feel this out. <laughs> I'm going to be doing this a long time. <laughs> That's all good. <laughs> Quite comfortable up here, young man. So it just fascinates me the longer I'm saved, the more I see this fight on righteousness. Somebody somewhere along the line must have mispreached and mishandled the word grace. So now we throw a red flag out and everybody that's preaching grace. And now you got a new believer and somebody's preaching grace. And now your red flag's up because you heard somebody say, be careful if they're preaching grace. And we're doing so much damage with all these concerns like this. Because the people that are throwing the red flag aren't taking the time to preach a clear presentation of grace. They're just attacking what's misappropriated. So you're swinging a pendulum and then you tighten it instead of preach the truth. And then a new believer has concerns and can't even hear the message because they're already red flagged by somebody in their life. We don't realize how much damage we're doing. See, you know, I, I'm so thankful for like, I got alone. When I got saved, I didn't have nobody in my life to tell me one thing or the other. I just ran to my bedroom with this hunger to know God. 
I closed my bedroom door and I didn't come out of there for a long time. I just opened my Bible and started reading. People say, see, well, you got misled. Somebody said, somebody wrote an article about me, said he, he's not saved. He's being, he's being moved by an evil spirit. <laughs> I'm like, what? So evil spirits have given me words and knowledge in the name of Jesus. I've seen cool stuff, healings. I sit on an airplane and know what's wrong with this lady for how many years and what it is. And that's an evil spirit. And then I pray for her in the name of Jesus, and the evil spirit is glorifying the Lord. I, somebody's confused. <laughs> it's just too easy to sit back and come up with some kind of assessment. <sighs> we don't understand, like, this language that we think is humility. Is way more deception than it is humility. It's way more lack of understanding and ignorance than it is humility. Well, brother, we're not perfect. You know, we're always going to sin. What are you trying to accomplish by saying that? You actually just keep the thing alive. You keep wearing the garment that permits you to be there. And then when you're there, you have no sense to repent because that's us, you know. It's amazing he considers us. It's amazing he loves us. Meaning in spite of me because this is who I am. And when this is who I am, this is what I'll be. See, unless you make a tree good. See, God is so wise. You got to take off the old. You got to take off that thing you've been wearing. That's why you don't look good in it. It don't look good on you. It don't fit you. Colors clash. And if it was a real garment, you'd have never bought it. So why are you wearing it? You don't look good in it. Take it off. And you ain't taking it off to become naked and ashamed. You're clothed in him. When you take it off, you're putting something on in its place. So when you put on righteousness, you realize you've been made right. To stand right in the sight of God. Holy, blameless, above reproach in his sight. Watch. If indeed you continue in the hope in which you heard. Now you go to church your whole life and never hear that hope. Not here. I heard that hope come out of three people. But you go to church your whole life and never hear that hope. Paul says, as you've been taught, the things he's talking about, you can go to church your whole life and never be taught those things. It's amazing the biggest wars on righteousness, baptism of the Holy Spirit. Not of God, not for today. You got all the Holy Spirit you're going to get when you get saved. Tongues of the devil. No, it's totally God. We're going to build ourselves up in the Holy. Yeah, yeah. It's it's in-house stuff. And it's vital topics. What are you going to do with me? I got saved at at, at work. I didn't go to church. I wasn't saved at church. I I was at work. (laughs) Nobody in the aisle. Nobody around. God sowed into me in my young life. There were seeds in me. He had access to my conscience, my soul. I'm second guessing my life. I'm convicted. There's times I would stop in my mind in the middle of a sentence and say, now why you got to talk like that? That is so, and I'd keep talking like that. Who's ever done that? You've been in a place and you know, and you second guess it and you get some option, but you don't yield to the option because you full blown into the thing, but you got the option. That's the love of God. It never goes away. He's just, pss, 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 pss. hey, there's a higher way. There's another way. It's called the. (laughs) It just, it just coming. I'm at work. I get saved. I go home. I'm overwhelmed. I got reality in my heart of God. I'm overwhelmed. I want to get to know God. I know he's real. Now I want to know him. I don't want to just preach about him. I don't just want to go to church. I want to know him. Like if he sought me out, why? What is this about God? What is this thing about the cross and my whole young life? Why would he do that for me? Because he loves you. Nobody ever explained that. Well, he loves you. And the way they would explain it was, well, in the midst of the way you are, he's willing to die for you so you can go to heaven someday. That's the best people told me. So they left me the same. But at least I'm forgiven. But I'm the same. And one day I'll go to heaven when I die, so pray this prayer. So you'll be forgiven because this is the way you are. But ain't nobody ever told me I could change. Nobody ever told me new life. 
Nobody ever said renewed mind, not conformed, but transformed. So I wasn't in any church telling me that. They were just telling me I needed to go to heaven and I'm going to die and you don't know when and you better be ready. Well, what is ready? A, a, a sinner's prayer is ready? Or fruit unto the king? What's ready? Stored up treasures in heaven or a sinner's prayer? See, we've made the sinner's prayer ready. We've created the sinner's prayer, by the way. It's less than 100 years old. It's a good tool if you teach them the whole truth. So I want to know this God that did this on this cross because why are you dying for me? Because I'm trouble and I can't get it right. And I got these things in my heart that whether I wanted them or not, I can't do anything about them. It's just the way I am. You ever hear anybody label themselves like that? It's just the way I am. We'll learn to love, love it or like it or don't like it, but it's the way I am. Well, if it ain't the way he is, it ain't the way you're created to be. Don't buy into something less than him. That's what I want to talk about for a little this morning. But this righteousness, you got to put it on. I woke up in the morning. I just barely slept. I was so worked up. I was in my room praying. I found my Bible. I knew I had a Bible hiding somewhere. I searched every drawer. I found my Bible. <laughs> I had it laying on my chest. I fell asleep. I wanted to read it when I woke up. But I fell asleep. It was wee hours in the morning. I woke up. I'm praying in tongues. Wow. Nobody in my bedroom but him. Amen. She said, well, that was the devil. That's your theology. <laughs> I woke up praying in tongues. Now, what are you going to do about that with me? How are you going to tell me it ain't for today and it ain't real? The presence of God was on me. So, so I was sitting there crying and crying. And this is how you know things are. When it produces holiness, yes. when you're convicted, the first thing on my mind was my definition of manhood and how I was sexually perverted and driven by a thing. And I fell on my knees and I cried out. I was hours old in the Lord. I cried out and said, you couldn't have made me this way. Wow. Yeah. That's what I said. I fell on my knees, nobody in the bedroom. I'm praying in tongues. And now I'm repenting for a perverted sexual view. You're telling me that's the devil. No, the perverted view is the devil. And the first thing in my mind was the conviction of that. And he wanted to change that. Because that thing drives people because it deals with sensuality and emotions and fantasy and fulfillment. And it's the answer for identity crisis sometimes or low esteem. It's this, yeah, and loneliness and. Not being wanted, not being needed. And that's, that's a topic that people delve into because it seems to temporarily fill those things. Well, my view was very twisted and Holy Spirit didn't want that in me. I'm praying in tongues and the first thing I'm praying in tongues, the first thing on my mind is that perversion. I swing over and kneel and fall down and start crying and said, you couldn't have made me this way. I had to become this way. Something had to change. She didn't make I'm hours old in the Lord and had that conviction. Don't you tell me Holy Spirit can't teach you when you're sincere and you want change. When you cry out for change, change is coming. When you want this, you're going to get this. If you want to become love, look, you can grab the language of wanting to become love. But if you want to become love, you're convicted by everything that's not love. You're aware of it. You, 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 you want change. There's a difference between wanting it and talking about it. We can sing I surrender all and have altar calls over and over and over. But you surrendering all is determined by how your life looks, your prayer time, your communion, your convictions, and how you follow that. It's not just a, I surrender all and then I go out and say, oh, well, see, I mean, I'm trying. No, there's a place to become. There's a place where if that sexual thing would have tried to come back and sneak, there's a place where I'd be so aware of it. That, no, you didn't make me this way. This isn't who I am. See, that's the big deal with Christianity. This isn't who I am. This is who I am. This isn't who I am. This is who I am. That's what you did a great job of this morning, man. This is who we are. When you preach this is who we are, it exposes who we're not. Light exposes darkness. 
So if you go back and re-listen to everything he said, and you say, whoa, then if this is who I am, then I can't be this. Then I can't be this. So if I'm accepted in the beloved, God can't disdain me. He can't be mad at me. He can't be angry. He's not giving me a silent treatment. People believe all that stuff in seasons in their life. Well, I'm just sure God's mad at me. Are you kidding? Why you were yet a sinner? He sent his son. He's always for you. He's never against you. He's always with you. He'll never leave you or forsake you. So if you're the enemy, just get people to believe he left you. And as soon as you start considering that, you got this hollow feeling, this empty feeling, this distant feeling. And now your feelings are bearing witness with your fears. Now you have a stronghold called a wrong belief system. And the only way to break it isn't prayer, intercession, and the anointing of oil. It's bringing one stronger. It's the truth that makes men free. It's not ministry. We, are, we, are, we, we have become ministry crazed if we're not careful. We just want more prayer, more oil, more oil pray in tongues louder. What about believing the right thing? See, if you ever just settle in your heart that he made you worthy, and you actually believe you're worthy in a sight, it changes. it's a game changer. If you actually believe you're clean and you're not trying to live clean, but you actually believe you're clean, you'll start living clean. See, this is the power of the gospel because it's grace through faith. It's not works, least any man should boast. There's not a super Christian on the planet. It's just people guilty of believing. There's no, there's no super Christians. I know we disagree with that and we think there's Christian heroes. But we're going to find in the end they were believers. You say, yeah, but they went the extra mile because they believed. So there's no sense for compromise. Amen. And we call them diligent. All heaven's going to see is they believed. He's going to get all the glory. And by faith, they received grace. Amen. Do you have to give yourself to him? Yeah. Do you have to spend time? Yeah. Do you devote yourself to the word? Yeah. That's about all you can thank a person for. Because everything a man is that you see, he is by the grace of God. And there's no boasting in men. Nobody has a thing unless it's been given. And if it's given, it's because they've believed. Amen. And they've received. Amen. Watch this. If you receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness, you'll reign in this life. Amen. So you see somebody reign and you think they're a super Christian? They're a receiver and a believer. Wow. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> people say I just want to be like you if they say that to you say well just be a receiver and a believer yes. I just can't wait to get to where you are where is that <laughs> just believe in him would you lay hands on me I want some of that That's, we're big on this stuff like I'm not making fun of folks I'm just saying we trying to shortcut in around believing yes. what about waking up every day just believing he's for you just believing that your life is worthy, that he washed you in the blood, and there ain't no looking back, but looking up from whence come your help. You don't have a yesterday. You have a present. You have a things to come. Life is in you, and life is in front of you. What if you just believe that, and it has nothing to do with how your daddy did and didn't, what he did, and Uncle Joe, and man, when I was nine, woo. What if it has nothing to do with that, because you're 39? Come on, I'm not trying to be insensitive. I'm just being real. I wonder if we're just believers. Did I turn you to 1 Peter? Yes. Chapter 2. Why am I talking about this stuff? I'm trying to do 1 Peter chapter 2. We'll get there. Because that thing I preached last night, you, you can't talk around the word. The word brings the thing. I, I gave too many examples. I didn't, I didn't give one or two examples out of context. Over and over and over. And there's more. There's a lot more. This is, here's another one that was on my heart. As soon as I walked out last night, I felt like this thing went, oh, man, what a good example. It wasn't on my heart last night. It was on my heart. It's still on my heart, so I feel like I'm supposed to share it. I'm trying to get there. The reason I took time to talk all this righteous stuff the sermon you heard last night, the message you heard, you can't just take that and go do it. 
You have to become it by yielding, by surrendering, by believing. And the only way that's going to happen is first seeing yourself the way God sees you. This worship leader said that stuff so vivid and so plain when he was giving them one-line exhortations. I was like, that's everything you were showing me, like to preach. And the worship leader sitting there, you think he'd be leading a song. He took more time with that exhortation than he took on any song. And it was powerful. I was looking over at you like, where do you find these people? Like that man's believing the word and he's laying it out for us. Like it's all here in this service. If you'll grab it, it's here. This ain't just church. This is like God speaking. This ain't entertaining. This isn't just all a fun place to be or a crazy place to be. I just thought I'd share multiple opinions. <laughs> Depends on the viewer. <laughs> <laughs> Description subject to the interpreter. <laughs> it was all there this morning. Like it ever, God is just ministering and speaking. You got to put it on. You got to see what he says and never change your mind. Amen. If you're clean, you're clean. You don't go back to unclean clean and on the way he gives us a provision he doesn't say and when you sin he says if you sin see people ain't preaching that distinction they talking like when no he said if what are you saying pastor you saying you perfect and you don't sin and you don't ever have to sin see that's heresy brother and all of a sudden there's this vow rising up in people <laughs> And they just want to argue, and then they can never actually hear the word or read the word and even hear what you're saying. Because I ain't even saying none of what they're saying. It's not even crossing my heart. Not even crossing my heart. This perfection thing ain't even crossing my heart. I just want to follow the word. I'm just like a little kid. And he says, he says, if, not when. That means I'm not damned to sin. That means I'm like, what? So all of a sudden, you're saying, I could get my heart filled with truth. I could get my heart filled with the right identity. I could put on Christ. I could wear a garment called salvation. I could walk in righteousness, and it could produce its fruit to holiness. And I'm a tree of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, so he might be glorified. I could be a tree planted by the rivers of living water, meditating day and night in the word. My leaf ain't withering, and I got fruit in my season. Are you telling me this is possible? See, you ain't talking me out of it. There's no, there's no discussion long enough, rude enough, mean enough. You ain't talking me out of it. I found it. Amen. And I'm going to be a believer when I stand before him. Amen. You can call me whatever you want, but I believe I'll be found as a believer. I didn't wake up to sin. I woke up to be his. That changes my, that changes my day. I woke up to be his. And righteousness itself will produce its fruit to holiness. All of a sudden, you're conducting yourself in a manner that you can never achieve on your own. Why? Because you are what you are by the grace of God. And I've applied faith to a truth, so I found grace to walk in it. And guess who gets the glory? Oh, and when you realize your life's changed, guess who you love all the more? Guess who you believe all the more? Guess who you're even more passionate about? Amen. What? He says, if you sin, not when. Know that you have an advocate, Jesus the righteous. And his righteous plea is like a mercy seat. That propitiation will be a propitiation for you. It means mercy seat. He'll be your mercy seat to God if you sin. Not when, if. And not only for your sins, but also the sins of the whole world. Now, that's where people take one verse like that, a half a verse, and turn it into universalism. And just say, everybody's saved. Everybody's good. They just don't know it. And in the end, we'll find we were all okay and nothing to worry about. And we could have stopped all this preaching. No, men always have to repent. There has to be a change of mind. Because if there's no change of mind, there can't be a change of heart. How are you going to receive a new heart if you didn't change your mind? 
What he's saying is all men are entitled to this kind of mercy. And while we were yet sinners, he sent his son. That's why an unbeliever can be healed. A lot of the church doesn't agree with that. Well, a lot of the church doesn't even agree with healing. (laughs) Why? Because we've let our results become our truth. Instead of his life, the will of God. Yeah? Yeah? So we pray for somebody and they die. We take it personally, internalize it, let the way that seems right to man spin in our mind 20 times and we come up with new theology and we have a life to back it up. But the life that backs it up is in Jesus. So we're going to be deceived. Because if you can't find it in his life, then why are we looking at it in ours? Why do we believe it? If I don't find it in his mouth, why is it in mine? If I can't see it in him, why is it in me? Are you following me? So this thing I preached last night, by the, I believe the Spirit of God. I believe it's calling us to so many scriptures that it says, hey, we're one. What did Jesus say in his prayer in John 17? Here's another one. See, there's so many. Yeah. <laughs> Father, when they become one, they, when they become one, like you and me are one. Is that same as? Is there an exception? Is there a limitation? When they become one like we're one, then the world's going to know. So why do you think there's so much of this going on? And we feed it. We feed the planet of the enemy. Animosity, whatever. Well, it ain't all that. Well, you don't have to. Well, that did. Well, God didn't mean that. Well, I know you said it, but. And now we got social media where opinions are a dime a dozen with zero accountability. Men can just fly out of their mouths, whatever they feel, whatever they think. And they just printing and typing and printing and typing and spend all day shouting back at each other. Paul said, don't be wise in your own opinion and we have a platform to cast them. You be careful. Don't be wise in your own opinion. And we made it easy for men to spout them. Well, this is what I think. Well, this is what I feel. Okay, I'm not trying to dishonor you. What's Jesus say? What's he think? Well, I don't believe people. Okay, so you don't believe people. But where do you get that I don't believe? Yeah, yeah. Where does that come from? Well, they said, well, I always heard growing up, heard that they said, who's they? And why are you putting all your stuff? We've done it our whole lives. You know this is true. You've been in a lunchroom. You hear two men talk about a topic you're unfamiliar with, and they're over at the lunchroom, and you don't even engage because you're unfamiliar with it, but you heard what they said. You internalize it. You hear it. And two days later, You hear another conversation that they were talking about or somebody has it with you and you say something you heard them say as if you think it's true. (laughs) Who knows what I'm talking about? Who's ever had that experience? And all of a sudden you're like, well, and they're like, well, how do you know that? Oh, I just heard some people talking about it, man. It makes sense to me, yeah. And all of a sudden you're talking about it like you are an authority, like you've had an experience. And all you did was overhear two men talking at lunch and you don't even know it to be true. But because you heard them say it, you're going to buy into it. Why don't we do that when he speaks? Why don't we fight the truth and dive into a lie? It's called the fall of man. It's called the way that seemeth right to a man. Because everything we've been trained by is the total opposite of the kingdom. It's 100. Love lays down its life for another. So the opposite is live at the expense of. That's what you do every time you have a bad attitude. Guys, you have a bad attitude. You put pressure on everybody around you and force them to have to respond to your attitude. Making it all about you. But you don't realize you're doing that. It's not intentional. It's perversion. Just a bad attitude. Living at the expense of. You're forcing people to have to respond to you, making it all about you. And some people draw an attention through that, being needy. And the highest grace they receive is the fact that somebody seems to care about how they feel or what they think. Has nothing to do with truth. Come on, we've all lived at that level our whole lives in some way, shape, or form. We're supposed to die and put it all off. And old things pew, passed away. And all things. How many things? All Woo! Not some. Not most. Mm-mm-mm-mm. Let me do this. 
Are we all right? Yeah. Verse 19, 1 Peter 2. For this is commendable if because of conscience toward God, one endures grief, suffering wrongfully. In other words, whatever repercussions you receive for making an error, messing up, causing a problem, doing something, you reaping a little temporary, some repercussion from something you did, but you saw, man, that wasn't wise, I shouldn't have done it. You got a grip on your heart, and you repented, but yet it's costing you something in the natural. Who knows what, what he's saying? So you, you suffered. Doing wrongfully, but you endure it, and that's commendable. But he's saying, what credit is it if when you're beaten for your faults, you take it patiently? In other words, you should. You should take responsibility and man up. Like, that isn't commendable. You say, well, I'm really taking it good. Well, okay, well, you should. That's what Paul's saying. He's saying you should. Or Peter. He's saying you should take it patiently. Now watch this. But when you do good, Who's ever had somebody judge your motive and you said something and you meant well and they said, I know why you said that. You just said that because you know. And, you, and you're like, what? I didn't even think that. And they sure you all that. And you're freaking out trying to defend yourself. And you all broken and shattered because they would even think that about you. And now you're like, Whoa! who knows what I'm talking about? Or you're mad, you're hot as a hornet. You're like, I can't believe that. I was trying to be nice. And I said that. And you want to go ahead and judge me and say I had that in my heart. Oh, you know how you always do. You make me so mad. I wasn't even thinking that. <laughs> Who's ever had that scenario unfold? <laughs> and the whole time you meant well. The whole time you said it for a right reason. And you were super sincere. And your good got called evil. And then you hurt over that and got broke over that. Or you said, okay, fine. Then I ain't doing good no more. If that's what you're going to think about me, I'm just. And then you're letting their judgment dictate your life. And once again, you're being pottered and formed by your surroundings instead of him. Wow. When you do good and you take it patiently. Let me tell you why we react so much when we do good and it gets called evil. You know why we react so much? Because we didn't do our good to just do good. We did our good to make people say good about us and think good about us and make ourselves feel good. So we're feeding off of doing good our identity. And when people don't acknowledge it as good, you still have that deficit. So you react. Yeah? You ever see somebody buy a gift for somebody? And the person opened the gift and you could see it on their face. They didn't like the gift. <laughs> you ever see it? Watch. And then I'm not being exaggerating here. I'm not imploding this. Watch. And then the person that bought the gift says, you don't like it? <laughs> what? Oh, no. I mean, it's okay. Okay. You didn't even look like it was okay. Well, it's just not my color. color I thought you loved this color. <laughs> and in the next two minutes, they got tears in their eyes. Because the gift they bought them, they didn't receive and like it. Yeah. And then they said, well, you don't have to cry. Well, well, I just went out of my way, and I paid money, and I didn't even, and I thought you loved it, and I just wanted to bless you. And now it's full-blown <laughs> tears. Who's ever seen this play out? Here's the deal. You never bought the gift for them. You bought the gift for you. And you were going to feed off of how they treated you when they opened it and loved it. And how amazing you were. And ain't nobody like you. And what would I do without a friend like you? And you were going to go. <gasps> and you didn't get that. And now you still got deficit. Because you're finding your identity through other stuff. You never bought the gift for them. You bought the gift for you. You gave it to them, but what you got out of the giving was what you was living for. And you didn't do it intentionally. You didn't even realize it. It's just a way that seems right. See, when you suffer for doing good and you take it patiently, Peter's got a revelation here. You suffer and you take it patiently, it's commendable for God. Why? Because all you're doing is for his namesake, for his honor, for the love of others. And your giving ain't for you at all. Because you denied yourself, picked up your cross, you're following him. So if you do good, 
and you suffer evil for doing good and get called an evildoer for doing good and you take it patiently, you're walking in what Jesus lived every day. Every day. He heals the sick and it had to be a devil. He speaks, has to be blasphemy. Who do you think you are? Oh, just from the beginning, the one that is and was and is and is is always going to be gone. Coming in a white horse one day. Sword coming out of my mouth says, word of God. King of kings and Lord of lords written on my robe. <laughs> Who do you think you are? He's as humble as could be. He lets men hit him. Boggles my mind. You think I'm going to struggle with unforgiveness when Jesus let men punch him. Jesus, son of God, who nothing was made that wasn't made through him. He comes for his own and his own knew him not. And he wept because they're sheep without a shepherd. So why not be a shepherd? Why not lead them in truth? No, how about take account of suffered wrongs and hold them accountable and judge them and shout them down? No! Love covers a multitude of sin. Mercy triumphs over judgment. For greater love hath no man than this. He laid down his life. That's his way. It's called the... Not a, the, that's different. So this is what we're following. We're not just here to get blessing. We're here to be transformed. If you're just here to get blessing, you ain't living blessed. Because you always need driven and looking over your shoulder and knocking on wood, whatever that means. How's things going? Good for now. Praise the Lord. telling the truth. That's why we all laugh because we've seen it. It's not even cool in today's church to ask people how they're doing. Because you know what they tell you? The worst things they're going through. When you say how you doing, they'll say, well, it's been tough. I mean, we're okay. We're hanging in there, but keep us in prayer. And then, and, but we're okay. We're believing him. We believe in him. And all of a sudden we reveal how we're doing is how it's going. Instead of who he is in me and why. And all of a sudden my identity is shifted by circumstances. Instead of freedom through truth. See what you're going through is never who you are and how you're doing in the kingdom. Who he is and what he accomplished is you. Your only face healthfully You only face what you're going through in that truth and come out good. Yeah? Just throwing things out there as we're trying to do something here. When we do good and suffer and take it patiently, it's commendable before God. Uh Uh-oh. Who's ever said, I just want to know my calling? Can you pray over me, brother, and see if you hear my calling? People say, I just want to know my calling. Let me show you your calling. For to this you were called. What was I called to? To suffer for doing good and take it patiently. What you calling? Never be moved by life because the giver of it's inside me. You're called. Why? Because you're in the world and not of the world. You've been given precious promises to partake of his divine nature, escaping the corruption that's all around you in the world through lust, through self-centered, undesirable, unsatisfiable seeking. You're, 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 the, the kingdom of God is all about receiving him in you so you can live from him. The kingdom is the king's domain. The kingdom is the expression of the king, the outraying of the king. You can, you can look at the king by looking at his kingdom. You see the king. You know who the king is by the way his kingdom is rolling. Go preach saying the kingdom of God is here. That means in reach. Well, where is it, brother? You're looking at it. It's in you. And we're supposed to preach saying. That's not just a bullhorn on a corner. That's life lived. That's walking in mercy, making peace, living in forgiveness, not unforgiveness, not struggling with your feelings. Feelings should be easy, man. If they're adverse 
and they're coming against the kingdom? Push them out. Go, wow, I'm glad I see that. That's simple. That ain't God. Not, well, you don't know how I feel. Well, if it ain't producing life, get rid of it. Because the last thing I need to do is take account of suffered wrongs. And if I don't suffer for doing good patiently, then I'm missing the point. Now, instead of owing men to love, now men owe me and they're failing and coming up short. And that's why I am the way I am. And now men are your reason for being. Isn't it amazing how cheap we can sell? Because we were trained by this stuff our whole life in the wrong home. And now we came out of darkness into the light. Don't bring the mentality of darkness with you. Because the light's always going to expose it. Yeah. You leave it there. You come out of darkness. Man, I wish somebody told me this when I was like 10. I'd have loved to have a shot at it anyway when I was 20. If I knew this when I was 20, I might have redeemed 13 more years. Now, who knows? God can make up for everything. I was saved. I don't even know if I should tell you. No, this is good. Okay. I, no, I wasn't sure. And then I questioned, and I got this real freedom in my heart. I was saved a very short time, but surrendered. Who knows what I'm talking about? Just growing in God. I was a month old. People were asking if I was a pastor. Just because of my dialogue and the way I could communicate, because I was with them. I was about nine months old when I preached in my first church. Wow. I was guest minister in several places before I was a year old. And the Lord knows I was calling me reverend and pastor. <laughs> I don't know where Anna is. But I actually wore suits in those days. <laughs> I'm so glad I don't wear suits. I'm not against suits. I just don't like suits. And I had ties on. And I thought I was supposed to. And people said, my wife said, you look so nice. <laughs> she would call me her Ken doll. I'd come down with my suit on. She'd say, oh, you my Ken doll. <laughs> I'm so glad I got out of them suits. said to me, I, was, I wasn't a year old. He said, do you realize I've expedited your life. I've brought your life to the place that you'd be if you'd have always known me. <laughs> That's how redemptive he is when you surrender. Now, you can't take that testimony and try to use that if you don't surrender. The redemption only works through the surrender. So what he's saying is, I finally got all of you. I finally got what I wanted, your life. Not your confession, your life. And because he had my life, he went zoom and took me to where it had been if I'd have walked out truth from my early days. What he's saying is, I'm the redeemer of even time, your testimony, legacy, treasures in heaven. It's not going to be as if you had a season where you didn't know me or live in my name. I'm going to make it like you've always known me and lived in my name. And he redeemed all those years that we... How does he restore the years of the locusts and the cankerworm? How does he do that? By making it as if it never happened and you never lost a thing. And you might only have been saved two years, but you're living like you've been saved 15. Yeah. And you can have as much of him as you want. And he told me a long time ago, as much as you see in people is as much as they really want. Because I don't come with portion. You can have as much as me. He told me that a long time. Dan, you can have as much as me as you want, that you can believe for. And as much of me as you see in people is as much as they really want and see and understand. And I went, wow. So I went, Phew, in a fast way. And he told me, you're living as if you've always known me. You're at the place you would have been if you'd have been born knowing me. 
how do you defeat that kind of mercy and grace and empowerment? If you're the enemy, you should just throw in the towel. But you know why he doesn't? Because he says, ah, God's one thing, but they're another. I'll get them mixed up in their feelings, get them wanting for something, get them self-centered, just get them hurt. And I'll just blow the whole thing up as if it's no real big deal, just theory and theology. And they'll go to bed lonely. They'll go to bed angry. They can't get out of their head what so-and-so said. And all of a sudden, it blinds them to what he said. And all of a sudden, they're making everything matter more than what matters most. That's the enemy's plan. He could care less that you come to church. He cares when you shine. He cares when you walk in the light. He cares when you're done wrong and you don't look done wrong. Oh, he cares about that. He's busy trying to do you wrong, and then you don't even live done wrong. That gets his attention. (laughs) Watch this. For to this you were called. What's your calling? To suffer for doing good and take it patiently. That sounds like never hurt, never offended, never discouraged, never taking account of a suffered wrong, and never building an alibi and an explanation for not looking like Jesus. Well, Pastor, back off because you don't know what I've been through recently, and you need to be more sensitive because you haven't been in my shoes, and you don't understand the magnitude or the time frame. You be careful. You don't come up with a reason that you buy into for not looking like Jesus. When we say he's Lord. The last thing I need is an alibi. When I have a reason to believe. Watch this. Why were we called to this? Remember why we're doing this verse? Because of last night. Just as. Just as. When they're one like. When they're one like. Whoo. You find any limit in that? Watch. Watch. Because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. <laughs> Philippians 2 is bombarding me right now. Watch. Have this mind in you that was also in Christ Jesus. Same mind. Not somewhat like, not a concept or two. The mind that worked in him, let it be the mind that works in you. And then he explains the mind. It's humility. It's not needing a reputation or be honored for who he is. But to come in as a servant and lay his life down for people. You ought to have that mind in you because that was in him. Not needing to be acknowledged for being the son of God. Not roll out a red carpet. Just come riding in on a donkey. That works as long as I can love people. Being born in a manger, I don't need any high beginning because I am the beginning. Have this same mind in you. That's the only way you're going to carry your cross. If he don't have that mind, he ain't making it to the cross. He's dropping that thing. People are going to push him too far if you don't have that mindset. If you ain't a servant to men, obedient to the point of death, you ain't making it to death. You guys say, who in the blank do they think they are? They don't know who I am. Talk trash to me, disrespect me, disregard me. I came here to save them, and they want to kill me? <laughs> Come on. We have enough language we've been trained by to make a pretty good talk show and find a villain victim thing in this. You ain't seen Jesus drop the cross, come up with a rational reason to back out and pull out. I ain't doing it. I ain't taking another step. Look at me. Look what these people done to me. I healed their sick. I raised their dead. I cleansed their lepers. I fed their bellies with food. And they're going to do this to me. Barabbas killed a man. I raised the dead. He's causing conspiracy. I'm bringing peace. And they want to let him go and kill me. You got to be kidding me. If they didn't change by now, they ain't going to ever change. I don't even know why I cared in the first place. You say, well, he can't talk like that because he's Jesus. He can't talk like that because he's love.
And we probably ought to follow, huh? He said, you ain't shed your blood yet in your fight against sin. But why are you weary and well-doing when you ain't shed your blood yet in your fight against sin? So if we're entertaining sin, we ain't fighting against sin. If we're living righteous, we're winning that battle because he already won it. Sin shall have no dominion over me. Why? Because the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Yeah? Yeah. Gospel's so powerful. We ought to we ought to see we're called to suffer for doing good and never let wrongdoing change our lives. You don't need a liability, a negligence attorney. Because Christ also suffered, leaving us an example that we should follow his steps somewhat. Follow his steps. If you look in your Bible, you have a colon behind the word steps in the English language. That means the next things he write are the steps. It's good as if you'd put a one, two, three there. The colon means here comes the steps. What's his first step? Who committed no sin. Right away, people balk. Well, that's impossible. Because we all sin, everybody sinned. You probably sinned already this morning. I had somebody say, we're just living so desensitized, brother. We're not in the level of holiness he's in. We got sin going on right now. We're sinning while we're talking. We just don't realize it. (laughs) And that's how sin conscious people are tricked into being to where they analytically rationalize it out and intellectualize it to the place where they are going to wear the banner of sin no matter what. How can I reckon myself dead to sin and analytically come up with a reason to justify a sin consciousness? See, because if you're not dead to sin, you can never be alive to God. When I'm dead to sin, it's what makes me alive unto God in Christ Jesus. When you're not dead to sin, you have the confession of alive in God, but you can't be alive in God because you're alive to sin. He took away The sin of the world. Watch. Who committed no sin? Is he talking about perfection? What he's saying is he never allowed the sin against him to give the right to produce sin in him. He never repaid evil for evil. He overcomes evil with good. See, we're following his footsteps. He went to the slaughter as a lamb to the slaughter without a word. Men are accusing him with twists in their heart. He doesn't facilitate the twist. He just stays quiet. When you justify and defend, you give people the right to judge. They already have wrong in their heart. Why feed the wrong? No matter what he says, they have a comeback. So just stay quiet and give up your life. Because if he be lifted up, he can draw all men unto him. This is his footsteps. He committed no sin. It's a position of the heart. He's not talking perfection. It's purity. Nor was deceit found in his mouth. Well, these people, they just, and all that stuff I did for them. See, if he's thinking that way, he can't go on with a sincere heart. He can't walk out in love. Do you ever see him sitting in a chapter on the Mount of Olives at daylight, and he's just bummed out? Peter comes over. What's the matter, Lord? I never saw your countenance like this. Well, don't try to preach to me for one thing, Peter. Well, no, I'm just saying, you just, I never saw you like this. Yeah, yeah, well, you don't know the plate I have and the things I carry and the way people are. And all of a sudden, he just gives this reason for his countenance. Well, that would be weird. That's why the chapter ain't in your Bible. But we got a lot of those chapters in our book. Well, you don't know what it's like, Peter, meaning good all the time and trying to do good. I mean, the other day when I fed them all, I mean, that was pretty amazing. We just had those little fishes. Oh, yeah, I know. That was cool. But the truth is they didn't care about what I was saying. All they want is food. That's why they tracked us down. That's why they found me those couple days later. I was whole way over there. And they found me. They just came for more food. They just wanted more food. And then when I laid it out and told them like it really was, what'd they do? They all just walked away. Why? Because all they want is need of me. They just bless, meet their needs. 
They could care less what I was saying. I'm just done, man. I ain't going out today. It's just going to irritate me because they're going to be coming around and, Lord. Just like that. Oh, it's you. <laughs> do you ever hear him ask, ask him to do a sign? And what he say? An evil and wicked generation asks for a sign. Do you, do you know why he said that? Because if you need a sign, you're boasting in your unbelief. If you need a sign, you're boasting in your unbelief. And, and the Bible says don't let anyone, be careful that not one of you is found with an evil, unbelieving heart. And unbelief has almost become common among us. You hear a testimony and you say, oh, I don't know about that. I don't know. That stuff never happened when I was in the room. I don't know how this stuff always happened. They go overseas and see all this crazy stuff. Why well, you know that stuff happening right here? <laughs> We've almost boasted in our unbelief. He says, be careful that no one among you is found with an evil heart of unbelief. He says, an evil generation's asking for a sign because what they're saying is, I don't believe it until you prove it. What he said, he said, the apostles, you believe in me because you've seen me? Now you believe because you've seen me? That's his guys he's sending out to rock the world. <laughs> he's correcting them right now. He says, oh, so now you believe me. Okay, Chris, so you felt my scars and now, you, now you're cool? Why weren't you cool before? Haven't I told you on the third day I'd rise? Why'd you believe anything else, man? Listen. You believed because you saw me, but blessed are those in these days to come that are going to believe and they've never seen. More blessed. Why more blessed? Because they don't have the consternation of soul. They don't have the peril of unbelief. They ain't on this roller coaster of emotions. They just believe. Substance of your hope. Tangibility of your hope. Evidence of what you haven't even seen. The knowing of what you haven't seen. Locked in and solid. On a rock. Storms, wind, rain ain't moving it, I believe. And you ain't put your hand in his hand. You ain't put your hand in his side, Carlton. You just read your word. And Holy Spirit went, yeah, 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 yeah. And you said, yeah. And he went, yeah, 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 yeah. And you said, yeah. And then when nobody was looking, you lifted your hands and said, I believe you see me this way. And I thank you. You called me to this. And the blood is enough. And Holy Spirit, yeah, 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 yeah. And your heart, yeah. Yeah? Amen. Woo! That's what it looks like. When he was reviled, he didn't revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten. But he committed himself to him who judges righteously. Can I paraphrase that for you without doing injustice? He committed himself to him who knows the flat out truth. See, but because we need something from men, it bothers us so bad what they think. We as society so shallow that this means everything. And you're willing to step out in that arena at the risk of that, which is devastating. And you won't even read the 20 of these because they're already up. But you'll read the one of these, and that thing will work on you and work on you. Why? Because you need these. Whew. Sorry, I'll back out. Are we okay? It's late. We need to quit? Are they got food ready? They haven't said anything? I said to, I said to David, I said, what are we doing with time? Like, do I just preach till they give us the word the food's ready? Or do I stop at 12? And he said, I guess a little of both. So we waiting for word from the command center of Freedom Fest. Which is probably Anna. <laughs> it's definitely the command center. <laughs> What did he do? He committed himself to him who judges. 
See, the Bible says when Christ who appears, who is our life, appears, will appear with him in glory. Amen. You better settle your heart on that. Yeah. That you keep your mind in heaven and not on the earth. Because you died and your life is hidden in Christ. And when he appears, who is your life, you'll appear with him in glory. I laugh and I tell people, you can persecute me all you want. You can write anything you want. But when he comes, I'm going to be standing there. I believe I got this picture. I'm going to be standing there holding his hand going. <laughs> and you're going to be, it's that guy. He's with him? I thought he was a heretic. How can he be with them? He preached the baptism of the Holy Spirit was for today. <laughs> How can he be with them? He preached it was the will of God to heal. <laughs> it actually says that your persecutors are going to give glory to God for your sake. Because in that day, they're going to be like, duh. Yeah? Amen. You better be careful. Knowledge will puff you up. Love will edify. Amen. If all you're doing is tearing people down, you might be puffed up in knowledge. Whoa. You find yourself way deceived. You can be so right that you're wrong. <laughs> he committed himself to him who judges righteously. Watch this. We're still following his footsteps. Who himself bore our sins in his own body on a tree. How do we do that? By carrying our cross. We're not bearing their sins in our body on a tree. But we're carrying our cross. In other words, we're not holding men accountable for their trespasses. We're too busy manifesting him. We're not here just to point out what you're doing wrong. We're here to manifest what he did right. Because we believe light is greater than darkness and the goodness of God leads men to repentance. I can show you in 2 Corinthians 5, and somehow we've missed this along the way, that he was God's ambassador representing God to the earth. And God was crying out through him, be reconciled to God, not imputing their trespasses against them. We are now those same ambassadors crying out, be reconciled to God. Why? Why? Not seeing what men are doing wrong, but knowing what they're called to, what they're created for, pulling them into their destiny, showing them the love of God through the cross. You're so much more than what you're living. Amen. Not how can you be living that way. You need to knock it off. That's how people have evangelized for generations. But 2 Corinthians says not imputing their trust. That's why you can pray for an unbeliever and he can be healed. That's why Luke 10 says you can go whatever city you're in. What city? And heal the sick there and tell them the kingdom of God is here. If you pray for them before you tell them, they might not know anything. And then you tell them after. Them not knowing anything shouldn't limit what you walk in, what you realize. Are you seeing? There's people today that will say, well, you should never pray for an unbeliever. <laughs> Jesus, everybody he prayed for was an unbeliever. <laughs> there wasn't one person saved that Jesus prayed for because he didn't even shed his blood yet. They were all guilty under the law. Every person was guilty under the law. And everybody he prayed for was healed. He even sent his men out in his heart, his name. Right. And they did the same thing. Now we're in a new covenant, New Testament through his blood. Whoa. Come on, guys. He bore our sins in his own body on the tree that we, having died to sins, might live for what? Wait, what? Live for what? Right to live for righteousness? So I should live for righteousness, that thing I'm going to be persecuted for? So I should be hungry for it and get filled and then live for it knowing I'm going to get persecuted for it. Wow. Righteousness must be important. There's two uses of the word righteousness in your New Testament in case you didn't know. The one use is your Carlton, you've been made right in the sight of God. So you can stand before God without any sense of guilt, condemnation, or shame. The work of righteousness or the fruit of righteousness is because of that truth. There's a manifestation of his nature in your life. So anytime you manifest an attribute of God, it's a work of righteousness. 
Anytime you show mercy, anytime you make peace, anytime you walk in tender mercies and loving kindness, it's a work of righteousness. It's the fruit of righteousness. Why? You've been made a tree of righteousness, and the Lord planted you that he might be glorified through the expression of him through your righteous life. That's how it works. That's what it means. So the work of righteousness is any expression of who God is, his attributes, his person. And the being made right and righteous is stand before him without any sense of guilt, condemnation, or shame. So having died to sins. So what are we doing? Dying to, dying to sins. That doesn't sound like, yeah, but brother, we're always going to sin. What are you saying? You're perfect. You don't sin. You're just, Come on, man. Everybody sins. We're all sinning. We're sinning all the time, man. So you're not even supposed to be thinking that way, let alone prompting that discussion. (laughs) You're supposed to be dead to sins, alive unto God, living for righteousness. This is interesting concerning healing because he throws it in right away. Hyphen, by whose stripes you were healed. How many times concerning healing... Do we feel like we're trying to earn it, position for it, don't feel we deserve it, wonder what we're doing wrong, what do I do to... I don't think it's been as simple as you love me, you're for me, you're not against me. Wow, you made me worthy. You have forgiven me of everything I've ever done. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Yeah? So I just gave you several examples. When, you, when they're one like we're one, have this same mind in you that was also in. You were called to suffer for doing good. Why? Because he left us an example and we should follow in his steps. Do you see how much scripture ties his life to our life and makes us one? Each seed after its own kind. So Jesus was the seed that fell to the ground and died sprung up and bears much fruit. Yeah? Each seed after. (laughs) What was lost through sin? The image of God in people. And man became a God unto himself and got separated from the source of life and the source of love. So he became in need of love. So he's looking for love in all the wrong places. Love comes and rejoins him and grafts him back into the source of love so he can once again be love, not need love. And all of a sudden, the image of God is restored back into man through the blood of Jesus Christ. And I was taught it was a prayer I prayed so that I was ready if I die. You all good? We good to wrap up? Yeah. One o'clock. We're good to wrap up. I give people a potty break and a stretch and hey and hi. What a full morning. I, I didn't even, I was, I got born again during the first part. I was like, I was looking for water baptism. I was ready to sign up. I felt like I wanted to get baptized again. Maybe I should. You know, I don't even know what I did. I don't even know if I was legal when I got baptized. (laughs) See, I baptized myself. I just saw the beauty of it, and I got in some water. I talked to him, gave my life to him, surrendered. When I came up, he seemed to appreciate it. Like when I come out of the water, I was very aware of him hovering over the water. I actually saw in Genesis how he was hovering over the water. And there was confusion. It was chaos. It had no form. And I saw the water baptism as the same picture. And my life without him was chaotic and had no form. I was a shadow, just a glimmer of what I was intended and created to be by God. So I figured when I go under the water, he's going to hover. I'm going to go under through the blood. I'm going to come up and break that water and be born again. How's a mama give a birth to a baby? What's the first sign you're ready to give that baby birth? Water breaks. I figured when that water breaks, it's going to be a brand new baby boy. Come on. And I just figured Holy Spirit midwife was going to pick me up and present me to Father and say, Look at this, Father. We did it again. 
He looks just like you. <laughs> now, ain't that something? When I look down these rows, you all look drastically different. So that ain't what he's talking about. But see, we can all look just like him. And that's what makes us one. If you're pursuing anything else, this is a narrow statement here. If you're pursuing anything else, you're not pursuing what he paid for. And if we fail to become love, we fail to fulfill the thing he accomplished and paid for. It's not when you pray a prayer to go to heaven, when it's you're restored back to his nature, his image, and his love. That's the paid in full. Not a prayer to go to heaven. That could be just for you. But when it's walking in love, that's the paid in full stamp. That's when the dividends of his investment, the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Did you ever think about that scripture? The glory of his inheritance, not your inheritance. His inheritance from the people is reproduced through as many as would believe. You get it? Come on, we can live this. Why don't you stand up with me? We'll close, we'll pray. And y'all can fest in your freedom. (laughs) Listen, the best thing you can do in your life is believe he loves you, believe he forgave you, believe you're clean, that you're as righteous as you're ever going to be, and there's nothing you can do to become more right with God than just receive it through the blood of Jesus Christ. You have to start where he finished if you're ever going to run well. You have to put on Christ. There's so many things we could teach. So, Father, we just thank you for the finished work. We believe it is finished. It is finished. The beating necessary, the price that needed to be paid, the wrath and the cup drank through the cross of Jesus Christ. When he died, we died. We were crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, we live. When he rose, we rose. You said we died in the likeness of his death. and the death he died, he died to sin once and for all. But the life he lives, he lives unto God. Likewise, we reckon ourselves dead indeed to sin, but alive unto God in Christ Jesus. So therefore, we never again present our members as instruments of unrighteousness but instruments of righteousness. So, Father, we thank you for this truth. I ask that this truth would burn in our hearts and never leave us go. I pray that no one would second guess it. And if any way we would think otherwise, you yourself would lead us on this path of truth and bring freedom to your people that this one seed would become much fruit. Let Christ be seen and realized among us. In Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. All right. We're going to pray over the food. Uh, If anybody's here to get baptized, make sure that you've signed up. And uh, we thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you for incredible fellowship. We pray the blessing over the food. We thank you for incredible time together, Lord. We ask that you bless our bodies Uh, Thank you for the nourishment of the food. We thank you for divine health all of our days. We thank you for all that your hands have provided today. We've already feasted this morning on the spiritual, Lord. We thank you that we can feast on fellowship and feast in the natural from this beautiful food that everyone has so willingly served. Thank you, Lord, for the heart of thanksgiving and gratitude that we want to show to every volunteer here. We thank you, Lord, and let the delight of their heart just be evidence that they've done it all for you. We just bless this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Go be festive.